Uh, it was from the widow of one of my best friends who died a tragic uh, death uh, in 1993 at the age of 54. He was an anthropologist, a French anthropologist, uh, who did amazing work on spirit possession in Mali. Uh, beside writing very lyrical ethnographies, he also uh, published six volumes of poetry and in his spare time was an art critic. His death uh, really sort of troubled me a, a great deal because it was a, a great loss for me as a person, but also, I think, for anthropology. In the envelope, there was an article uh, published in Le Monde magazine in, in France. And the article was an interview with Ali Farca Touré. Perhaps some of you, I'm sorry, perhaps some of you have, uh, know him. A, he was a great. Uh, uh, guitarist, uh, playing the muse, Tacumba music, music from the north of Mali. And uh, in this article, uh, he uh, criticized very, very significantly uh, uh, Western economic policies that had underdeveloped Africa. But he also criticized uh, Western insensitivity to African sensibilities, African culture. And his major complaint about Western insensibilities was that anthropologists uh, revealed secrets that, uh, in their works that should have never been published. And he cited my friend's work. And then he went on to say, because my friend, in his view, had transgressed, had transgressed uh, the trust that he had established with uh, Malian practitioners, they took vengeance on him. And he said, uh, uh, you know, in, in this interview, he said, well, they took vengeance and they sent from Mali to Paris uh, corte. In Songhai, corte is ma magic, sorcery. And that they sent this corte, which manifested itself in my friend as a brain tumor and brought on his premature death. Attached to the article, was a little note from my friend's widow. She asked me, is this possible? Is this possible? So I was, you know, what the hell am I going to say? Uh, is this possible? So the first thing I did was I went through my friend's book on the Gimbala, which is a spirit possession in, uh, spirit possession in, uh, in the upper Niger River. And I looked for possible transgressions. I could find none. I could find none. So uh, I went through his other works to see if I could find any uh, transgressions. I found none. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, the only thing I could find was that in his book, he made reference to Ali Farka Touré in before he had become famous. Uh, not in a you know, sort of disparaging way, but in a way that was a little bit, it was, what, he, he wasn't saying he was a fantastic person. So uh, he said, he said uh, this is what he said about Ali Farka Touré. He said, once, Ali Farka Touré once lived uh, as part of an entourage uh, of uh, Kunambe Samba, his grandmother, whom he claims was a great priestess of the Gimbala, the Mali spirit possession troop. He spent a lot of time with, his old, uh, with this old woman. She grew attached to him and began to transmit her knowledge to him. On her death, Farka hesitated to involve himself more fully with the Gimbala, but eventually he did. He received his inspiration, a gift from God from the genie of the river, who helped him uh, um, as he was looking for something to, to add to his music. He happened to use the, uh, he, he took up the Jerkale, which is a one string uh, lute, played in Mali, um, and he started to transfer the rhythms of the Jericale to his guitar, which became the foundation for his music. Okay, so it's, it's no secret that uh, Ali Farka Touré, and, and you know, this, this, the notion of long distance magic and things like that is you know, something that's rather common in, in West African literature on, on spirit possession and sorcery. So it was no secret that Ali Farka Touré was a Gao, which is a religious specialist, who is a healer and a spirit medium. And um, he is um, similar to a, a group of uh, uh, specialists uh, where I do my work further downriver, the Sorco, 
And these people are said to be of the river, of water, of substance. It is said that Sorko uh, can live under the river for periods of time where they receive instruction from the goddess of the Niger River, whose name is Harakoy Diko. Uh, Ali Farko Ture is well known that he disappeared for two years uh, during, his, you know, during his initiation and wandered about the Hamburi in Mali, in, in this landscape. Uh, and when he re after he returned from his disappearance, soon after he came under the tutelage of his grandmother, he came back as a, uh, you know, a musician, a jericole, and uh, Ali Farko Ture said himself, he said this, uh, he said that, um, he told my friend in his book, thanks to them, the spirits, referring to the river spirits and their priests, I have a well that will never go dry. So he attributed his musical inspiration to the spirits. All right, so that's, that's the extent of the, 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 the transmission. So when I received the envelope, I had a, a significant emotional shock. I wanted, I wanted to be able to uh, you know, respond to my friend's uh, widow from the safe confines of social science. All right, so meaning that uh, I wanted to respond to these allegations of Ali Fakutore, his assertions about sending long distance death magic by saying, well, I, I looked at the evidence, I found no transgressions, uh, and I, I wanted to say, how can Corte, sent from a distance of 3,000 miles, precipitate a deadly brain tumor? Perhaps uh, his claim, Ali Farkasre, resulted from, uh, maybe he was a little irritated the way uh, my friend uh, presented him. And so these, I, I felt comfortable. It made me feel comfortable to write back and say, okay, you know, I've experienced many uh, sort of inexplicable things in my experience uh, as an apprentice to healers in, in, uh, in Niger, but uh, when it comes to long distance magic, I have my doubts. So I wrote back and I said, you know, I don't really think that, that that's what happened to, to your husband and my friend. Um, but my friend's death continued to trouble me because I lived in uh, a world of Songhai uh, sorcery and magic for a very, very long period of time. Over, I'd studied with my teacher for a period of 17 years. And so in that universe, there's a different kind of logic that operates. It's a logic which suggests that maybe it is possible for this sort of thing to happen. My teacher, Adamu Tongo, I'll, I'll bring up his picture in a moment, um, you know, there, there are weird things that happen. So there are Sorko who live under the, under the water, they disappear for a period of time, they come back, and they, they're empowered to do, uh, they're empowered to, to, to heal and, and uh, do things in, in the river. Um, and uh, my teacher was a Sohanchi. Sohanchi are sorcerers who are descended from Sunni Ali Bear in the 15th century. And they have uh, remarkable capacities, one of which is to displace themselves, right? So go off to some distant place, deliver a healing touch or a mortal blow and bring back tangible evidence of their trip. All right, so he would, uh, so I was you know, immersed in this sort of uh, logical environment that it was very different from the safe confines of, uh, of social science. All right, so, so in my own case, two bouts of serious illness linked to my immersion in the Songhai world of sorcery made my friend's untimely death all the more troubling to me. In 1990, the sudden onset of uh, serious illness, high fever, weakness in the extremities, and uh, a never-ending series of hallucinating, uh, hallucinatory dreams, uh, made, which made sleep impossible, forced my evacuation from Niger. I had to, uh, I had to get the hell out of there uh, because I feared for my life. Um, physicians never discovered, you know, and when I was evacuated from Niger, I was housebound for two months, two weeks to go out. Um, physicians uh, did all sorts of tests. I went to have uh, work done at jo the Johns Hopkins Medical, uh, Tropical Med Medicine Center. And no one, uh, the physician said, well, we never really could discover what happened to you. Well, you know, they, never, well, they couldn't find uh, a tangible reason for my illness, my weakness and extremities, et cetera, et cetera. 
But my colleagues, my collaborators in Niger, they said, well, we have other ideas. We think uh, that sickness had been sent to me. They said that what they called the magic arrow, sambele, uh, had pierced my body. And they said that, you know, when that happens, you must go home, you must stay in bed. They gave me aromatic resins to burn in my house, and they gave me uh, powders, to, powders to, uh, to consume. And once I did that, uh, over a period of time, I slowly regained uh, my strength and my, my balance. Um, so I left Niger in 1990, and fearing for my life, I didn't know if I ever returned. It actually took me 18 years to, get, to, to come up with the courage to return there for fear of slipping back into that situation. So soon after my return to the United States, uh, a series of uh, you know, interesting uh, uh, serendipitous events dropped me into the vibrant world of Harlem, the scene of a wonderfully chaotic African market on 125th Street. And my, first, my field site there was under the marquee of the Apollo Theater. It's a great place to do field work. And so I reconnected with Africa and America, and I started to befriend all sorts of uh, people from Niger on the streets of New York. But um, soon, when I, when I was coming to write my book about that experience, Money Has No Smell, uh, a routine physical in 2001 uh, revealed a diagnosis of lymphoma, a hematological cancer. All right, so the first thing that slipped into my head was not whether I was going to face chemotherapy, not uh, you know, not so much uh, the, the why me, et cetera, et cetera. What slipped into my head was uh, my friend. Uh, and I wondered, irrationally, I wondered if someone had sent Corte to me. I also wondered whether I would suffer the same fate as my friend. All right, so, so time will not permit me to go on. I could go on for a long time weaving this story uh, again, you know, weaving, uh, weaving the various threads of this story together. So, I'll step back. In our representations, most of us are trained to tell, not to show. To denote the social, not to evoke it. In this uh, presentation, I have tried to connect with you through what Jerome Bruner called the narrative construction of reality. There are many elements to Bruner's approach. One thing is, is that narratives underscore our human vulnerabilities. In my case, uh, they, the, the narratives I've, I've, I've articulated here bring to the surface you know, my and perhaps your deep fears about how we confront uh, misfortune, how we confront illness, how we confront death. Second, uh, narratives, uh, in, in my case today, evoke the human dimension of our inextricably intertwined professional and personal lives. So uh, the personal and the professional, especially in anthropology, are inextricably uh, linked. So how do we express these important themes in our work, these very human themes? How do we, how do we express them? It's clear, to me at least, that writing anthropology, since I'm the one talking about texts here, is an activity that requires an open-minded and playful approach to exposition. When I'm writing or thinking about writing, which is most of the time, things pop into my consciousness that lead me into felicitous directions. When I sit down to write ethnography, memoir, fiction, or a blog, I move into a different space. When you write, strange things sometimes happen. As I read through the file, struggling to find a topic to discuss at a conference on anthropology and the paranormal that I attended last October, a copy of Ali Farcatore's Le Monde interview, uh, which I hadn't looked at for seven years, fell to the floor. That inexplicable event created a perfect storm, or what Arthur Kessler once called the library angel, that not only generated this presentation, but my next book project as well. <laughs> During a dog walk, a character from a work in progress talks to me telling me uh, the tone of such and such a passage is wrong or that particular dialogue is off the mark. Staring at the computer screen, 
a distant relative or long lost friend visits me, reminding me of a turn of phrase that clears the path through uh, a textual thicket. If we are open-minded and playful, these elements can be woven into our narratives that can evoke powerfully complex social uh, realities. When I sat with my teacher, Adamu Genitongo, when I sat with my teacher, Adamu Genitongo, um, he told stories to convey the most important lessons of his being in the world. When I slowly read him the manuscript of what was to become my first book, In Sorcery Shadow, he told me I needed more stories in the text. I asked him if I should recount his story in more detail. He said, of course. Uh, but you should also tell your story as well. His personal challenge has shaped all of my professional writing in which ethnographic narrative has been foregrounded, in which an attempt has been made to evoke the texture of intersubjectivity, in which an effort uh, has been made to describe sensuously the nature of place, space, and character. In this way, I have attempted to use narratives like those I've recounted today to evoke themes of love and loss, fidelity and betrayal, and courage and fear, central elements of the human condition. That's what we're about in anthropology, at least in my view of it. Remembering Adamu Tango's example, narratives can some, sometimes transcend the here and now, which means that they can be fashioned into texts, films, or multi-sensory installations that remain open to the world. For me, that is the scholar's greatest challenge and the scholar's most important obligation. Thank you.